Arthur's sitting up by himself. Come look. Are you still declaring attackers? Uh, yeah. Nathan, he just wrote I love mommy in four different languages. Yeah, I'll be home for dinner, honey. He's thinking. If I send the elves at Ben and the tree folk at Dan, then my Beastmaster Ascension will have enough counters to kill them both. That is, unless Dan counters my Might of Oaks and or Ben kills my Jiraga Warcaller before damage occurs, in which case I need to send in more attackers. But how many? How many powers? How much power? 2, 4, 7, 12, 17, 24? Unless I... 3, 9, 14, 19, 26... Oh my god, math! Ugh! How do good magic players do this? What, what would that guy... Bubba B B B B D do B B D do Brian Bron Brian 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 help me. What's up, Nate? I'm trying to kill these guys, but I can't do the math. Well, adding the damage is just simple arithmetic. Right, but I have to factor in the probability that Dan has a counter for my pump spell and that Ben might kill my elf lord. You know what mana they have open. You know their deck lists. You know what spells they've cast this game. How many cards are in their hands and libraries. You should be able to calculate this probability. Right, but you're a pro player, so it's probably easier for you to do that. I mean, would you mind running the numbers for me? Well, I'm not really Brian. I'm your imagination's version of Brian. I can't do math you can't do yourself. Right. How about Brad? Is he available? I don't think you know how this works. I don't? If you want some advice, don't worry about the math in a game of Commander. It's not like this is the Pro Tour. Good point. Nathan, Arthur just opened his own 529 college savings fund. Look, Nate, just make your attack. If you're short on a couple points of damage and they kill you on the backswing, who cares? Get up, kiss your wife, and hug your baby for crying out loud. You're right. Thanks, guys. You bet. No problem. Tree folk at Dan, elves at Ben. I'm dead. Terminate your war caller? Yep, I concede. Good game. Good game. Thank you, gentlemen. No problem. You can make the check payable to Bradley Nelson, B R A D. -L. No way. This was my idea. Make the check to Brian Brown doing. I'm the one that taught you telepathy. I taught you how to play Legacy. Child, please. How many decks have I loaned you over the years in Standard? A bunch of really bad ones, like Brave Naya was just straight Brave garbage. Brave Naya was like the best deck. Unplayable. Unplayable. You... I played it in one tournament when 0 2. It's just so bad. Are you kidding? I played it in a tournament when 1 2. It's great. If you're like me, math was probably not your favorite school subject. But if you play a lot of magic, you're learning math whether you know it or not. Between sequencing spells, tracking life totals and mana costs, predicting combat outcomes, and calculating probable draws, winning a game is about running the numbers. So it's no surprise that the people who design magic are pretty sharp mathematicians themselves. I'm here with Ian Duke, who designs Magic the Gathering for Wizards of the Coast. Um, Ian, as a game designer, what role does mathematics play? Yeah, mathematics is absolutely huge in games in general. I mean, anyone who's played Magic knows it's a very mathematical game. You're thinking about probabilities, you're thinking about um, how to arrange things in combat, how to attack properly. But what many players don't appreciate is actually designing games itself uses a lot of mathematics. Um, we're thinking a lot about, you know, how frequently do cards appear in booster packs? Um, how frequently will cards appear in a draft? How do we balance the power among colors by making sure there's an equivalent number of cards of reasonably close power level? So all these things, um, we use a lot of math uh, behind it to balance out the game. How do you decide, like, what creatures get what power and toughness in order to make for an interesting combat step in a limited environment? 
So we use a system um, in our limited balancing called quick pointing, where we'll assign each card a ranking on a scale from zero to four. The zero power level is worse than a blind phantasm. So blind phantasm is a two and a blue for a two, three creature. If you're worse than that, you get a zero. If you're better than Blind Phantasm, but worse than a Windrake, that's a two and a blue for a two-two flying creature, you get a one. If you're better than a Windrake, you get a two. If you're better than a Dark Banishing, you get a three. And if you're, you're sort of a bomb rare and limited, maybe better than a Mahamodi Jin or something, a Shivan Dragon, then you get a four. And so when we're bouncing other colors, we try to make sure that each color has about the same number of cards in each of these brackets. To me, game design is it is a category of engineering. That's how I view it. Instead of building a bridge or you know architecting a new building, uh, we are we're designing a game. We're engineering a game. And for a game as big as Magic, with as much history as Magic, that's constantly evolving, it really is this iterative engineering mathematical process that we go through set after set. For this next segment, I wanted to quiz pro players with math questions, but Sean, the dude behind the camera, told me that it'd be too boring. So in the spirit of getting quirky, I present to you Stump the Pros, Troll Edition. I'm here with the one and only Paul Cheon. So Paul, serious question, question number one. If you cast the spell Think Twice, and then you flash it back, how many times have you thought uh, three times. No, it's four times, actually. Because you think twice, and then you flash it back, and you think twice again for a total of four times. Okay, all right, my bad, I'm sorry. Four times? No, it's twice. You cast it once, and you think, and then when you flash it back, you think again. The card is called Think Twice. This is not a difficult quiz, Frank. No, but I mean, think twice, you think twice. twice. I am the quiz master! What winter-themed card has the flavor text Strength in Numbers? Right. Goblin Snowman? This was not scripted or staged. He actually knew that. <laughs> that was that the right answer? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking something winter-themed. I couldn't, like, the, the <laughs> sweet. What percentage of modern decks are main decking Goblin Snowman this weekend at the Pro Tour? I would guess zero, but given that you ask, maybe someone is playing it as a singleton? No, I'll just go with zero. It's actually 0.4%. There's two decks. Um, I can't tell you who has it, obviously, for confidentiality reasons, but there's like a red-green Goblins Turbo Fog deck that's out there that I'm really excited to see. I don't even know what the card does. I'm definitely going to check it out. Maybe we missed something in testing. What are my chances of becoming the Team Channel Fireball equipment manager to, you know, sleeve your decks, bring you guys water, mop your sweat off the table, that kind of stuff? Uh, you can start doing that right now if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm a little thirsty, so if you maybe. I'll, I'll be right back. <sighs> Here we go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Is there anything else I can get you? No, I'm good for now, thank you. I think I have the job. All right, now for a real math question. You draw an opening hand with a fantastic low curve, but only one land. You're certain that if you draw a land in either of your first two draw steps, you'll be in great shape to win the game. Assuming that your library is always 40% land and ignoring the negligible change with each draw step, what is the percentage probability that you'll draw a land in either of your first two draw steps? That would be 1 minus 0.6 squared, or like 1 minus 0.36, or if you want it as a percentage, would be 64%. I'm here with Eric Froelich, who has just locked his fourth career Pro Tour Top 8, a terrific accomplishment. What did it take for you to achieve this much in your Magic career? I don't have a good answer for you, honestly. I'm not one who's generally short on words, but it, it's hard because obviously it is emotional and um, 
I've been playing this game for 20 years. Uh, I qualified for my first Pro Tour. I top eight at GP when I was 13. I turned 31 on Monday, which I guess will be in the past by, by the time this actually airs. This being your fourth Pro Tour top eight is a very special number, as I'm sure your name will pop up a lot more in the Hall of Fame voting. Do you have an opinion on, on your own Hall of Fame candidacy? The Hall of Fame means everything. Like it's it's the crowning achievement that you can have in in this game, and it would mean the world to me. Whether people think I'm worthy or not, you know, that's not for me to decide. I've I've put up some good numbers over the years, and you know, I've had some personality conflicts with people. I've and and I respect that people, you know, will hold that against me. Like I, that's completely fair and understandable. I mean, I, I'm just trying to do my best to to change some of that, be the best person I can be, put up the best results I can, and, you know, hopefully I'll just keep winning. <laughs>
Cohen summoned primeval titans on turns three and four. While Leon burned one titan to death, the second finished off the defenseless Spaniard. But Leon halted Cohen's momentum in game two by praying to the infamous Blood Moon, whose ruinous crimson light smothered Cohen's lands, rendering them barren and useless. Leon then proceeded to create infinity times infinity to the infinitieth power for Rexian clerics, each of whom carefully held a human brain as they attacked Cohen to death. In game three, Cohen repeatedly tried to control Leon's psyche with the spell Hive Mind, but Leon cast three counterspells to prevent that from happening, and when the Blood Moon showed its face once again, Leon moved ahead two games to one. And though Leon couldn't create countless creatures in game four, his finite number of fairies and clerics fought hard enough on his behalf to capture the game and the match, making Antonio Del Moral Leon the champion of Pro Tour Fate Reforged. Antonio, your friends tell me that you are a master of the Splinter Twin deck, but what does winning this Pro Tour mean to you? Una satisfacción muy grande por el esfuerzo que he hecho, que es que me he matado a jugar. He estado todo el día, 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 día jugando y hasta, hasta lograrlo. Congratulations to Antonio Del Maro Leon, the champion of Pro Tour Fate Reforged. I just want to go home. I know. I really should have researched this more.